Dividends, brought to you by Macquarie Limited and the Land Portal Foundation. My name is Chris Tanner. I'm a principal consultant at Macquarie, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator for this webinar. I have a life, lifelong interest in Indigenous and customary land tenure systems and livelihood strategies, and the land rights of women is, of course, a key element in this wider picture. In a moment, I'm going to invite my colleague Liz Day to tell you more about the work she's been leading in this area for the past five years. But what I want to emphasize from the start is the remarkable impact that this project has had in a relatively short time. You will see today how investing in a diverse group of gender and land champions, both women and men, selected by their community can be a game changer, not only for women, but for the wider community as well. We hope that our discussion will leave you with an understanding of how this methodology works and how it could be applied more widely. Now, please let me introduce our panelists. Elizabeth, or Liz Daly, is also a principal consultant at Macquarie and leads our Women's Land Tenure Security, or WALTS, project. Liz has written and presented widely on gender and land, women's land rights, land tenure, and social change. She also currently serves as a board member of the Land Portal Foundation. Narangarel Nara Yansanja is executive director and the founding member of the Mongolian NGO People Centered Conservation, PCC, and a senior team member of the WALTS project. She has worked in participatory rural development and community based natural resource management since 2003. Joyce Indicaru is the Gender in Mining Officer for Haki Medini, which is an NGO based in Tanzania. Joyce is also a senior member of the WALTS project and has played a central role in the WALTS participatory research and champions training initiative. Also on our panel to bring in a global uh, perspective is Michael Taylor. Mike is director of the International Land Coalition, ILC, a global alliance that strongly promotes land rights and people-centered land governance as fundamental to building a more just and sustainable world. You, the audience, are of course warmly invited to participate as well. We will start with a panelist dialogue and then open the webinar for a Q&A session. If you have questions, please post them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use a chat box for that purpose. We will try to answer as many questions as we can. If we don't address your point, someone from the team will endeavor to get back to you later. We will also aim to reflect your questions and comments in our post webinar write up. Please also note that a report containing the key findings of this project is also available. We will share the details as well as the recording of this webinar on the Land Portal's website and on the Macora website. For those who tweet, please join in. You should be seeing a slideshow now with suggested Twitter handles and hashtags. So let's get the show on the road. Liz, um, may I ask you first to begin telling us a little about the way the project was structured and how it evolved? So over to you. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, good to be here with everyone today. Um, so let me start with um, what is WALTS? Um, it's a strategic long-term action research project that aims to support improved gender equity in land tenure governance. Um, we use the acronym WALTS um, for Women's Land Tenure Security, but I want to emphasize that the, um, the main focus of the project is actually on improving gender equity more broadly um, within land tenure governance at local levels. So in other words, we're seeking to strengthen and protect land rights for women and vulnerable groups, but within the wider context in a way that's win-win for the whole community um, rather than either or. Um, for this reason, we've been uh, committed from the outset to taking a long-term and highly participatory approach in our work, building local relationships and capacity in a way that includes the whole community. Uh, so stage one of WALT began as far back as October 2015. We teamed up with our partners, PCC in Mongolia and Haki Medini in Tanzania, and we selected four pilot communities to start working in, all of them pastoralist communities and all in mining affected areas of those two countries. Um, 
So the initial research we did at community level involved baseline surveys, uh, participatory field work, um, and then an in-depth process of results validation through community feedback meetings and a national stakeholder workshop. Uh, the aim at this point firstly was to gain a solid understanding of key local issues around land, natural resources and gender, um, of course all in the wider context of pressures from land grabbing and climate change. And then second, uh, we wanted to see how we might continue working with the communities in order to support them in finding solutions to what had emerged to them as the most pressing issues in their local areas. So we secured solid buy-in from the local governments and communities um, who we found very supportive of our consultative and community-led approach. And we began a stage two in early 2018. Uh, so stage two, um, this involved a detailed participatory process, uh, firstly to select locally respected men and women who were willing to become trained champions for land rights and gender equity in their communities. Our champions come from diverse backgrounds. They include ordinary community members, traditional leaders, uh, women and men of all ages, all income groups, all education levels. And the champions took part in an inclusive, iterative and participatory training program, which we rolled out in two rounds, um, with the men and women taking part jointly and equally. So round one took place in 2018 and 2019 uh, in four communities. Round two uh, kicked off at the beginning of 2020 in two communities. And in round two, uh, the, the first group of champions um, participated as mentors with the new cohort and had nominated the new cohort to start. So the focus and goal of the training uh, was raising, raising awareness um, of land and gender related laws so as to empower the men and women in the communities to share their knowledge and work with their fellow community members and leaders to strengthen gender equity. So just briefly what we did, uh, we had a replicable format across all the communities but we tailored the content according to the local issues. Our team worked really hard to create safe and mutually supportive spaces for our champions to grow in confidence, um, both individually and as a group. And this confidence building element was a really key element of our whole process. Uh, we had a lot of vigorous group discussions. We used role play techniques a lot. Uh, we had gender segregated sessions and we had joint sessions, um, plenaries, small group discussions, a whole range of um, participatory techniques in there. And we took a stepped approach to the training as well, allowing ideas to germinate and bubble up organically. Um, we've just published a report today of our main findings um, as well. So you'll find a lot more details in there of the, some of the things we're covering today. Um, I just uh, quickly highlight two headline results from our experience. So um, first off on the slide in front of you, as you see, um, one of our key results is that we've um, we've seen a significant increase in women's participation in community decision making on land in really a relatively short time um, when dealing with the land sector, just over five years. Um, and this has taken three forms. Uh, women champions have been increasingly confident in uh, speaking up in meetings. Um, they've become more willing to contest elections and take up local leadership positions. And very importantly, we've seen our men champions strongly supporting uh, their fellow women in these roles, particularly in Tanzania with the, um, the traditional leaders there. Um, and then the second headline result, just to, um, just to highlight, is that we found investing in women's land rights also protects community land rights. So really we found it is a win-win and it's not an either or. And as a result of the WALTS training, our champions are now working with their local governments to help solve land disputes, um, to better protect their communities, land and natural resources, as my colleagues will be able to share with you more today. Thanks, Chris. That's great, Liz, thank you very, very much. Um, let me pick up right from that and ask Joyce to elaborate a little on how the Waltz Champions Training Program in Tanzania has affected community participation in decision-making. Joyce, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I would like to share um, a few examples from Tanzania on how World's project uh, has actually impacted community decision making. And on this one, I would at least share two examples. Uh, one of, uh, of the issues that um, came about in terms of community decision making World's project in Tanzania is uh, women in the two project communities taking more active role in community decision making. 
on the initial stages of this project in, the, in both communities in Tanzania, women wouldn't talk anything when they come to the class, they wouldn't contribute, they wouldn't even raise up their hands, whether they had the concerns that women would actually participate or say or speak up, they were not really saying things. And it is because the culture or the customs and tradition of the Masi communities have nurtured women not to argue or to speak in front of men. So when we continue building the capacity through the legal awareness, uh, confidence building, these women start uh, to be active. They start to contribute a lot in the meetings. And as we talk today, they are more far confident and they can really contribute a lot in the meeting. They cannot really let anything go without their concerns, without their ideas heard in the meetings. And um, secondly, uh, male Maasai elders are encouraging women to take uh, part in uh, debates and in decision making in the community. In the Maasai communities, especially the two one that we, uh, World Project was actually uh, operating, uh, men are the only people who make decisions over everything. So whether women issues were taken or not, but men were the only people who ever make the decisions of everything in the Masai communities. So as we continue building this capacity, as we continue to train these people, as we started to cut a lot of issues from the laws, like what the law says when it comes to uh, governing or managing the natural resources, including land, that there is a need for women also to be part of it, that's when these men start to transform themselves from believing that they are the only one who want to make the decision into actually engaging women. And so women again, you know, gain the confidence, start to be speaking, because even men, especially traditional leaders, started to actually encourage them a lot to speak in the meeting. Thank you, Chris. That's great, Joyce. And that's really wonderful to hear that story of yours. Now let's turn to Mongolia. Uh, Nara, how does improving women's land rights protect community land rights in, in your part of the world? Thank you, Chris. Happy to share also some more experiences in Mongolia. Uh, uh, in two communities in Mongolia, the gender and law training uh, helped the people to feel more confident when they're negotiating with the mining companies. For example, last year, uh, the communities uh, with, led by our champions who participated in the world's training program uh, could update the agreement with the local uh, coal mining company. And plus, uh, a, a female uh, champion with her community could stop new mining activities in her area. So having said that, the champions' knowledge of law helps them to deal with the investors and also land officials. Because often these land officials and uh, also investors use a uh, very complex and juridical language, which is very hard for local people to understand. So uh, now local people understand and they know what is happening in there and then the whole process. And also it gives chance in that case, you know, like to exercise their rights. Last, last but not least, the, the communities also support the communities, uh, the champions also support the communities by working with the local government in participatory and gender equitable way. For example, uh, some of the local governors uh, told us that the champions uh, reminded them to consider gender issues when they develop, when the local government develop new regulations and planning the local level. Thank you very much, Chris, and that's it for me from now. Back well, to thank you. you. Thank you both very, very much, Nara and Joyce, for two really informative accounts from from very, very different ge geographical and, and cultural contexts. They give us a very clear idea of what Waltz has achieved, and it, it all sounds very exciting. Um, we'd like to hear now from Mike. Mike, would you like to say something, please, about how these experiences in decision-making and empowerment of champions reflect what you have seen in, in other countries? Uh, do you have any reactions for these Waltz findings so far? Uh, thank you, Chris, uh, and a big congratulations to uh, to you, uh, to Liz, uh, to your colleagues in Mongolia and Tanzania. It, it's very, very interesting, and I would like to just say a few words why uh, I think uh, your project over the last five years, and it's very, it's very good of you to take the time to tie it up and and present it to us in such an understandable manner, uh, is so significant. Um, 
for our network and, and I think beyond uh, uh, our network uh, and the ways in which it resonates with, um, with what we hear from our members. Maybe just taking a couple of steps back and, and giving a bit of context, which I think helps explain the significance uh, of your work. We really, at this point in time, have a very urgent need to upscale the recognition of community land rights. We have for the first time land rights goals um, that are globally adhered to and sustainable development goals. Uh, but no countries are reporting them on them. And in fact, we have very little um, evidence that we're moving towards uh, the, the land targets in the SDGs. And so we have a situation where uh, we estimate that roughly 50% of the land surface of the earth is claimed by local communities as belonging to them um, through custom and tradition, but only 20% of these claims are actually recognized uh, by their governments. So that gap between um, <clears throat> the 10% of the land surface of the earth, which is recognized and the 50% which is claimed is a massive, massive gap in, uh, in vulnerability um, and gives a, a very immediate idea of, of the task we have ahead to scale up and to scale up urgently, because as we know, there's, there's increasing demands and pressures. Uh, on land and natural resources. And so the challenge we have in scaling up is how do we how do we scale up in a way which overcomes the risks that in securing community land rights, we don't further disadvantage those members of the communities that are already disadvantaged. disadvantaged. And obviously women are, are, are the biggest uh, group there, but we, the same can apply also to, to various minority groups, particularly indigenous peoples, where they may live on the margins of, of uh, um, uh, more dominant ethnic uh, set, settlements. And that's what's, what's so interesting and exciting about, uh, about your work is that it shows us that it is possible uh, to do that. It is possible to think about scaling up from the bottom up, because, because if we scale up without doing it from the bottom up, uh, then, then we can do more damage uh, uh, than good. And so the idea of local champions, uh, and I think what's amazing is, is the stories we've just heard have talked about how local champions really are, are building democracy from below. If you ask our network what their work is about, many of them will tell, will tell you really at the, at the fundamental, at the basis, it's about building democracy at the local level. It's about enabling the women, the men, the young people in communities to be deciding about their own future. Uh, and, and we know that that starts with land rights because when you have secure land rights, you have a position uh, in which to, to often um, choose, look, look at future options and, and decide uh, what's best. So I'd just like to throw out uh, three reasons uh, in particular from the, from the, the, the perspective of, of the work of IOC members, why your local champions approach is, is so significant. I think the first is one of sustainability. So you're not um, ignoring tensions uh, that exist at the community level, but you're facing those head on and, you're, and you've managed to facilitate processes whereby opposing perspectives and tensions on women's land rights within the community can actually be dealt with, can be addressed for what they are, can be dealt with. And through that winning champions that are not women themselves, I think that's a fantastic part uh, of your story. Uh, and it reminds me of uh, the work that one of our members, Transparency International, has been doing in Ghana with training women to use video to expose corruption by traditional leaders in the communities in land allocations. Uh, and by um, bringing evidence of, uh, of wrong practices within the communities, women are able to bring that out into the open, have it discussed, have it dealt with, uh, and move on from that. The second is uh, that, that it's also very clear from, from what you said that it strengthens the whole community. So it's about um, equal rights for women, but it, but it shows that equal rights for women is, is beneficial to everybody, uh, not, only, uh, uh, not only women. So, uh, so it's about enhancing the capacity of women to defend everybody's land rights, to defend the whole community's uh, land rights. And, and our member Ukobak in uh, Uganda um, has been able to share similar stories uh, where of, of a similar of, of an approach where whereby that whereby women's land rights uh, has very clearly had an impact on on the whole community because women have become very active in policy dialogue and engaging with government officials um, for the benefit of the community as a whole uh, and not just women uh, and then thirdly 
women's land rights is one step in overcoming wider discrimination uh, uh, against women. Uh, our members uh, of IOC work for men, women's land rights in the context of work, working for, for across the board respect uh, for the rights of uh, a woman. And I think emerging, nurturing the emergence of strong women leadership uh, and the recognition by leaders, by male leaders and, and women leaders that this is good for everybody really has uh, a long-term impact on many aspects of gender equality uh, at the local level. Um, and work by one of our members, Trocare in Nicaragua, on women's empowerment and recognition that started with land, but then spread through to economic activities and, and many other aspects, um, showed how powerful that is, just as you have uh, uh, with your work. So uh, just in conclusion, uh, and coming back to the scaling up idea, because I think, I think this is, this is really where our future challenge and opportunity from what you shared uh, lies. Um, is this, is, this is what we need to think about how we can do now is take what you've managed to show in Mongolia and Tanzania and think how that can be not just replicated because replication often doesn't work as you know in the land sector, but adapted uh, and, 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 and rebuilt into different contexts uh, in ways that it can work in, in, uh, with communities in other areas as well. Our members um, have partnerships in more than 40 countries um, for what they call people-centered land governance. So building, uh, bringing community members, government officials, NGO supporters together to build a people-centered approach to how land should be, uh, should be government, governed. Women's land rights is absolutely central to that. And I think what you've, the, the, the methodology that you've shown and you shared with us today um, can very much inform uh, this kind of work. And, and we'd, be, we'd be really interested in, um, in seeing how we can take some of the learning from this and feed it back into those platforms that are, that are prioritizing women's land rights. So thank you so much. Uh, all the best uh, to you, and we look forward to hopefully working together with you uh, in the next steps. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Mike, for those really excellent comments, and also for bringing in material from, from other countries, which is very, really useful. Um, one thing you said particularly struck me, your, your, your point about building democracy from below. I think that's really essential. Um, and the numbers about the percentage of the planet that is actually claimed by indigenous communities and local communities whose land rights are still not yet recognized. Um, and this is a fundamental overall challenge. And I think the interest of the interesting aspect of Vault is that it shows that this approach can actually address that particular issue as well without necessarily undermining the, um, the rights of women and other people within the community. It's quite the opposite. I think your story again about the video addressing corruption and male leaders is a, a salient point in that context. So once again, thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. Now, let's move on now and dig into some more of the Waltz team's key findings and takeaways. Firstly, back to Liz. Have you been able to measure the increase in, in knowledge and awareness of key land and gender related laws among the women and men champions that you've been working with? Um, yeah, indeed we have, Chris. Um, so we've got a graph coming up on screen now here. Um, uh, just overall, across all four communities, we found a 50% increase in levels of legal awareness after the training. Um, so what we're showing in the graph is the different surveys that we did to try and assess that. Um, we asked all the champions a set of five questions to test their knowledge of the relevant uh, land and gender related law. Uh, survey one, which is the pale blue one that took place just before they started the waltz training. Uh, survey two, which is shown in the dark blue where you see the big jump up there on all five questions uh, that took place immediately after uh, completing the training. And then survey three, which is in orange, um, that was with the original cohort of champions only. So those trained in all four communities in round one, and that took place approximately one year after they completed the training. Uh, so there's a clear upward trend there across the board. Um, and we've just compared it in that graph as well to our community level baseline that we did in our earlier research. I'd also say comparing by gender, uh, the overall increase in legal awareness among women champions uh, is 62% and among men it's 37%. So we definitely saw a big improvement there for women across the board. Um, Chris, just briefly, I'd also like to highlight another of our, um, our key headlines, if I may. Um, this is our finding that training, training men and women champions in land and gender has had a ripple effect on broader social norm change. 
Um, so this includes changes in attitudes and behaviour around gender-based violence, as well as uh, topics around economic empowerment. And this has actually been the icing on the cake for us as a project team, um, because the changes we've seen have been coming up from the champions themselves. So let me just quickly explain what I mean. Um, when we started the training program, uh, right in the very opening session, we used an icebreaker exercise to get champions thinking about gender concepts in very practical ways. And then in all the training sessions, uh, whether we were focused on land laws, investment laws, mining related issues, um, our team wove discussion of gender concepts and issues throughout. But we still weren't really sure how directly we would actually be able to broach and discuss some of the very sensitive issues around gender-based violence that had come up through the communities in our stage one research. Um, we wanted to make sure we were being led on that by the champions and, you know, not coming in as outsiders effectively, um, you know, talking about these sensitive issues. And what we actually found is uh, through the role plays, particularly in the early sessions, that issues around gender-based violence began to be raised more openly by the champions themselves. So, and, and that was coming from the men as well as the women. Um, and particularly in the context of discussion around land and mining disputes um, and around household and public decision making. So based on that, we were able to then introduce more focused content and resources um, on gender-based violence. And this actually contributed to our champions resolving to make certain changes and to take certain actions across their communities, um, which I know my colleagues will be able to give you examples about that. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. This really does sound impressive all the way through. Um, and indeed, let's now turn to our other colleagues to, to, to get some more detail. Um, we know that gender-based violence is a serious problem everywhere, and it's good for all of us to hear of an approach that can impact on this very difficult and painful issue. So let's turn to Joyce. Would you like to share with us, please, how the WALTS program has impacted on gender-based violence in Tanzania? Over to you, Joyce. Absolutely, Chris. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, there are so many examples of how WALS has actually helped it to, to reduce gender-based violence in the two project communities. But I will at least highlight a few ones. And one of the good things that we have seen in terms of reducing gender-based violence in the two uh, project communities is the issue of men supporting their female family members uh, to, own, uh, to get a piece of land that they own for themselves. Look at this one. Uh, in these two project communities, every valuable resource, that means the land or the cows, all of them belongs to men in these communities. And even surprisingly, women also are also uh, people who are owned by men. Like I could say they are also properties owned by men. So you can imagine if a woman is also considered as a valuable resource owned by men, there is no way that um, you can give a property to own a property. So you cannot give a woman a property which is land. Both of these are actually properties. So uh, when we, we start to build the capacities on these people and actually define what gender-based uh, violence is all about, what are the consequences if all these are lived uh, and solved and dealt with, and how can we make a healthy community? And these people start to understand, ending up nodding their head, heads, understanding that involving, uh, having women to own also land is actually a good thing. And that is uh, actually uh, making them a, a healthy community. We all know that land is actually everything, you know, like life depends on land. So these men start to encourage uh, a female to get the land. Plus that even some of the champions were able to give uh, the family owned land to some of their female members. But another interesting uh, example is actually young men taking up more of domestic duties. Uh, in, the, in these communities, there are roles and responsibilities that the community has assigned it to be implemented by a certain sex, like uh, issues like cooking, maybe uh, washing or fetching water or collecting food. All those are considered uh, traditional in these uh, project communities to be women's roles. And if a man is actually found doing one of those or those responsibilities, uh, people may question, like, what's wrong with this man? Because it's a shaming man doing women's roles. But 
As we continue to teach these people to build the capacity, to create awareness through legal, these people start to transform and they start to understand that supporting their female, their wives in the family, there is nothing wrong about it. It does not change them from being men, but they are men who actually love and care. And the last example on this one is um, women now sit on the chairs in the meetings rather than standing up or sitting on the floor. Listen to this one. I am a Marcy woman, so I know what I'm talking about. In the project communities, when we were just starting, we found all the women were giving away their chairs to men, when, even if they are the first one who reported in the, um, the venue where the meeting is taking place, where the training is taking place, every time a man gets in, a woman has to give a chair to a man. And that is in the Maasai communities is a must to do because it is being done by the name of respect. That's what the community believe like. Giving away a chair to a man is actually a respect. So uh, when we also continue to talk to these people, to teach them, to create awareness through the legal uh, 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 training, talking to them about what are the gender-based violence issues, they transform themselves and start also to uh, to give the young men now giving all the women the chairs. So it became vice versa. Not everybody, but good examples can be seen in these communities. Thank you, Chris. Back to you. That's, that's great, um, Joyce. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think an example such as that about the chair is it, it just captures so much about the changes that um, are taking place. Um, thanks in, in, in a large part to the Vault's methodology and the, and the project itself that uh, you've been uh, implementing in, in Tanzania. Let's turn now perhaps to, uh, to Mongolia. Uh, Nara, have you seen a, a similar thing happening in Mongolia as a, as a result of your work there through the Vault's project? Thank you, Chris. Yes, happy to share some more experiences from Mongolia. So in Mongolia, participants of the Vault's training are now actively promoting services for women affected by gender-based violence. <clears throat> for example, one uh, male champion made a big sized posture of phone numbers in case of GBV and hang it in the community uh, hall. And because he and other community members, member noticed, members noticed that, you know, the uh, often these small sized postures are uh, hesitant, uh, the, the woman hesitant to approach this small uh, sized posture because, you know, like they always afraid that they can be noticed or seen by others because it's such a uh, sensitive issue, of course. So, uh, but the big posture hanging in the wall now can be seen by everyone and without being noticed by other members of the community. So uh, these kind of small, but, uh, mm, uh, you know, like potential to bring high impacts in the local areas, uh, in interventions are initiated by the champions themselves. So, yeah, by the way, the big posture uh, man is actually paid from his pocket to make this big posture. So uh, also another thing I want to share here is uh, more awareness uh, on different types of GBV, including the vulnerable man issue in Mongolia. You know, when we start uh, the, gender, uh, the training program, some of the female uh, champions shared that, you know, they didn't know that the, the violence, there is other type of violence. They thought that only physical violence considered the real violence for them. But they said, we now know that there is economic violence and other violence that, uh, uh, the, for example, mental abuse is also considered the big violence type of issue. So uh, PCC members, including myself, have written uh, several blogs on this issue for the last couple of years. And uh, yeah, the vulnerable male issue is a big issue, big gender issue in Mongolia. And uh, lastly, uh, yeah, regarding the household chores, like Joyce shared also, similar experiences also observed in Mongolia, but traditionally Mongolian men do some household activities at home, but more and more young uh, uh, men, you know, they really try hard uh, to help their wives. For example, uh, there are several uh, young male champions who, or some of them also married during the training program. And they shared that they really try hard, you know, like, to do cleaning 
washing, taking care about the young kids, and even the uh, milk cows is needed. So they influence uh, the young uh, generation, uh, young people in their area also. So thank you very much, Chris, over to you. Thank you, Nora. Um, let's now turn to the issue of um, economic empowerment and um, ask how Waltz has contributed to a greater understanding of women's land rights and gender, gender equity in this context. Firstly, Joyce, uh, could you please tell us how Waltz has achieved what appear to be significant changes in, in the Tanzanian communities that have been supported by this project in, in terms of the economic empowerment of women? Thank you again, Chris. Um, yeah, uh, I have a few examples to share on this one. Um, one is actually an increasingly confident among women to at least negotiate better on the prices uh, for the minerals that women use to sell. In both of these communities from Tanzania, uh, because there are um, there is mining activities taking place in their communities, women and other vulnerable uh, groups in the community, including poor men or people with a disability, used to go uh, used to go to their mine sites and. Uh, collect leftovers minerals. And when they collect, if they get some, they have to sell, to go and sell to the traders or to the buyers of the minerals. So in the beginning, uh, women couldn't really negotiate very well. And those buyers were the one who are actually planning for the prices. And women couldn't even argue on that because again, they are nurtured to not really argue so much uh, with men. But when we continue to build the capacity, when we train these uh, community champions on legal awareness, uh, um, confidence uh, building and public speaking skills, women start to have a confidence to be able to negotiate better for better prices. And even they are getting a very good support from their husband. And something else that I want to share is actually women now are investing in their own land. Remember I said above that men have started to uh, make sure that their family, their female family members get a piece of land. And so these women who have been able to get a land either through legal procedures or even from the family now have started to invest in those lands actually by growing the produce for sale. But also there is an increase of women understanding uh, to understand or to recognize that there is a need actually to have an independent income for them for the reason of actually finding the equality, but also to reduce uh, dependency of women uh, to men. Back to you, Chris, thank you very much. That's, that's, that's great, Joyce, thank you very much. Um, Nara, perhaps following on from what Joyce has just been saying, um, and again, looking at, to, looking at Waltz and how it's contributed to relations, for example, between the communities and, and other stakeholders like the mining companies that have had such a huge impact on their lives, particularly in your area. Would you like to say more about economic empowerment in this wider context, perhaps? Thank you, Chris. Uh, again, very delighted to share uh, more stories from Mongolia. Uh, like in other pastoral areas of the world, Mongolian uh, herders are pretty much tightly, their, their livelihood especially, uh, pretty much a tie, uh, connected with their pasture land. So more and more herder communities have confidence to stand up against mining company to protect the grassland. So for example, two years ago, Waltz trained female champion together with her communities, caught the mining, new mining activities in their area on drilling and trucks are drilling and you know, like uh, digging down in the most nutritious part of their pasture land area. So she and her community uh, members uh, approach to these mining guys and calmly ask them to show all the necessary documents uh, they have for the permission to do the permission mining activities in their area. And also at the same time, she rang to the uh, local officials, including some, gov the, some governor and the land officer and the environmental officer also, and to do some investigation. They came, this, the local uh, authorities came and they did some investigation. Shortly after that, this, they, uh, the mining company stopped their activities in the area. So later, when we were having uh, one, say, one of the session, uh, the training program, she also she shared that they could have not done it 
or if they didn't know uh, how to ask the right questions, what to ask, and uh, from those mining from those mining guys and uh, the right the right steps to be taken. So thank you, Chris. Over to you. Thank you uh, again, Nara. That's that's a really good story. Um, it really underlines that knowing what to ask and what to do next is a big part of defending your rights. And I think in this context, the if you like the legal empowerment and the legal, legal education that comes through with the Waltz program is, is is particularly important. Now, um, let's turn to the the key question, perhaps, of whether Waltz, the Waltz experience, the Waltz approach, has potential that can be scaled up within each country and can serve as a useful model for other countries facing similar issues. Um, let's turn to Nara first and ask her to kick off this part of our discussion. Nara, could you say something please about how Waltz has influenced policy and, and government initiatives at, at national level in, in Mongolia? Absolutely, Chris. Yeah, we see very big potential for this approach in Mongolia. Mongolian government has included uh, participatory and gender equitable principles of world training program within the national uh, guideline on landscape planning for local government. And uh, it clearly shows that world's uh, approach has huge potential you know, uh, to produce much wider impacts on women's land right beyond the communities we have worked under the uh, project. And we work on this, we work very closely with the uh, with national government. And uh, here is the uh, guideline that is included in this guideline. And uh, it's uh, available online. And also the printed copy of this uh, is uh, distributed and uh, sent to all uh, provincial levels, home level land officers. Yeah, thank you so much. And it's obviously, you know, like, contributing to improve the uh, land tenure governance at the national level. That's, that's really you? good to see. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you, Nora, for that. Um, it's really refreshing, I have to say, to see a national government take notice of this kind of project and to um, really seriously integrate the findings into its, um, its, its new literature uh, for, for a wide, a wide range of stakeholders. Um, turning now to Tanzania, perhaps, um, Joyce, would you like to say something about um, how the, the Waltz Champions approach is being uh, used or, or is, is being uh, requested in other parts of Tanzania? Absolutely, Chris. Uh, yes, it's very important to actually continue to use uh, this approach. And uh, look at this one. Many, in many other communities where Hakimadin is actually working in Tanzania, actually, especially those communities affected by uh, mining activities, have been requesting for the replication of that particular approach in their communities. And look at this one. The most people affected when it comes to uh, land rights are women. And at the same time, women are not actually included in decision making when it comes to uh, it is located for new uses. We all know that if they are not included, actually their exclusion at the end of the day makes them to lose the access and use of that particular land. The land that they have been um, collecting firewood from, they have been getting water from, getting uh, forestry products, maybe grazing on it, or maybe even contacting a subsistence farming. So when they lose that particular land, at the end of the day, these women are forced to find an alternative. And an alternative in many cases might be a problem or might exacerbate a problem because one of the, of the issues is actually women are forced to work long distances to find those services elsewhere. As they do that, they may even again face very dangerous environment like sexual violence maybe, or even rape or being attacked by dangerous animals. Therefore, my suggestion would be, I will be so happy if this, uh, What's uh, approach being replicated elsewhere, especially to communities facing the same challenges because of the very vivid life examples from Waltz in the other communities that this intervention has already taken place. Thank you, Chris. Back to you. That's, that's great. Thank, thank you both very much for that, for all these detailed insights. I think they really give a, a flavor of the, the impact of the project in, in these two 
very different parts of the world. Um, the, the, the issue of gender relations and changing gender relations being at, at, at the center of the, of the whole question. Um, let's look now again at the, the question of takeaways from this approach and turn back to Liz. Um, what are your thoughts on expanding the Waltz approach to, to other places, please? Um, yeah, thanks, Chris. So just briefly, I think I can just make three points here. Um, so first of all, in the areas where we've been working, um, we actually think that um, uh, amplifying what we've done in those neighbouring areas would be relatively straightforward, particularly by building on the mentoring process that we've been developing um, over the last year in particular. Um, further afield, um, we found that uh, the baseline participatory research that we did uh, was very important for laying groundwork, building that community engagement, understanding the issues, um, and doing that, you know, with solid local partners um, as well. And then more widely, um, we do feel that uh, the approach has potential for wider applications, and we're going to we're, we're in the process of continuing our learnings around that and having the opportunity to have this webinar and hear from so many other stakeholders in the sector on that today is really important part of that for us. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Liz. Um, and again, thank you to the whole Waltz team for sharing what the project has achieved and its potential as a model for addressing not just women's land rights, but a whole, whole range of other, of other social questions. I think once again, it underlines the fact that if you, if you change the customary gender relations between men and women, it impacts on a whole range of other different issues, different behaviors and so on. Things. So lots of things change as a result of changing that fundamental equation between men and women. Um, it's now time for our question and answer session, but before we start, please note that we're asking all participants to complete a brief survey before you leave the webinar. Uh, if you have to leave early and still want to ask a question, please do so. You can do this by typing it into the Q&A box where it'll be noted and addressed later by the team, or you can include it in your response to the survey. Uh, we've included the link in the chat. Now, my colleague Casey is directing questions to me, so I'm going to have a look up at the chat box and see what's coming through. Um, Katie says, let's start with a question that we've had from several participants. That is, we've seen a lot of cases where communities come together for a development project, and then once the project leaves, cultural norms can revert back to traditional ways. How do you guarantee sustainability after the project ends? I think that's a really excellent question. It applies to many development projects and across the board, but I think it's a really excellent question in this context. So which one of you would like to kick off on an answer for that? Maybe Liz, is uh, the... Sure, um, yeah, I can, I, can, uh, I can jump in on that, Chris. Um, yeah, there's a few, uh, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, obviously all projects do have to grapple with this issue of sustainability. Um, so, you know, that's been one of the reasons for our long-term approach, trying to, um, build that sort of organic uh, sense of our champions as a group who would continue to work together after we are, after we pulled out. Um, so we've had a bit of a trial in a way of sustainability and action over the last year or so um, due to the pandemic. Um, obviously, we have had to uh, modify our fieldwork program. We've had to adjust our training um, program around that. And what's, you know, what really came out when we did our rounds of final feedback interviews a little bit earlier this year was how much the champions had actually um, kept taking initiatives. So some of the cases Nara was just talking about um, with regard to the mining companies, that was all happening when we weren't actually there at all in the communities that the champions were taking these initiatives by themselves. Um, some of our champions have set up a Facebook group, um, you know, that they're using that to inform each other of, um, of, you know, things that they want to monitor and bring up in, uh, in um, local meetings, in local forums. Um, the example uh, Joyce gave earlier in Nicenia, that was a really big one, uh, sorry, of the chairs, is a really big one in Nicenia, which was one of the communities, again, where uh, we had not carried out round two. So partly to test sustainability, uh, we decided at the end of 2019, we had been in four communities, we uh, stopped working in two and we continued with our mentoring process in the other two. So we were trying to see which approach would be more successful. Now, um, I'm not sure to what extent it's actually uh, cause and effect, but when we looked at the data on the legal awareness that we put on the graph earlier, uh, when we compared 
the two communities where we had continued working with the two communities where we had stopped working, there's actually a slightly bigger increase in improved legal awareness in the communities where we pulled out of. And our hunch is that that's because knowing that we'd gone that the champions were working closely together to make sure that they were still collaborating as a group. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I, th I mean, it's a, it's a really important issue and something we're still trying to learn from, but I think those are just some, some things I can, I can say for starters, thanks. Yeah, I mean, this, this is such an important question and I was just wondering whether uh, perhaps Joyce and Nara might like to add something to that at all. Do you have any concerns about the sustainability of this approach into the future? Joyce, perhaps you'd like to speak on that? No, Liz has actually covered everything. Okay, all right, there we go then. Um, let me perhaps go on to the next question then. Um, we have a question from Joyatri Ray from Equations India, who works on sustainable tourism. Um, what were the strategies that helped men to be supportive of women's decision-making? Joyce, perhaps you can tell us about the approach in Tanzania, how to bring men on board. How do we bring men on board, Joyce, from your experience in Tanzania? Okay. Uh, how do we bring men on board? It's actually to, from the initials of starting the project, men should be involved from the very beginning because if we do not do that, if we exclude them from the very beginning, that's when they end up actually mistranslating the, the project, so to say. For example, when we were actually starting uh, this project in this post community, I was talking a lot about women rights, land rights to women, uh, importance of actually involving women in decision making over natural resources, governance and all that. Many men actually started to question like, okay, why are we here? It looks like something is for women. But it took time for us to really explain slowly. And then later on, these men start to understand that, okay, so that's why we are here to start to know that both women and men should be involved in decision making in everything we do. So it's very important to have them from the very, very beginning and explain the purpose of that particular project that they are the key players when it comes to actually giving rights to women, especially that we know most of the practices are being practiced by them, which in one way or the other pre oppresses women. So having them on board very in the very early stages, that helps to go with them all together and support women's rights. Thank you. That's great. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Joyce. Um, Nara, would you perhaps like to say something about that in, in, in your context? Thank you, Chris. Um, how you, just how do you to... bring men on board in Mongolia? Is there any, are there any differences? Yeah, just want to share one experience. You know, that when we started our uh, training program in Mongolia, when uh, the male champions uh, say that it's a gender issue, you know, like if it's once gender issue, it's all women's issue, why we are here? They say, you know, <laughs> so they were even laughing, you know, like, but after two, three sessions, even after two, one session, you know, like they said, gender issue is not a woman's issue, you know, like it's, a, it's also men's issue. And meaning, you know, like men and women, they have to really work uh, together and to do this, to, to, to <clears throat> really participate in the decision-making processes. So this is really powerful if they are all together, you know? So just want to share this experience. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, while we're waiting for some more questions to come through, I'd like to maybe pick up on that and ask a question myself, if you might allow me. Um, I, I'd be interested to know what kinds of men put themselves forward for the for, to take part in this project. I mean, is it always the younger men, or is it some of the older men? Do you, do you have a um, a way of spotting who might be a good champion or or, or a better champion than somebody else? Oh, that's a good question, Chris, um, and actually gives me a great opportunity to just say a bit more about how we went about um, choosing our champions. So, um, in fact, as I mentioned at the start, it was really a community driven process. So throughout uh, stage one of the research, you know, we were going around doing community baseline survey. We did participatory focus group discussions and we were constantly on the lookout for, um, you know, people that seemed to be quite respected, that were 
um, uh, you know, had some positions of influence or were contributing well in the research. And we also, um, uh, when we came to the actual process of selecting champions, we talked with uh, different local people, different leaders. We got a whole lot of nominations for that. And one of our questions, uh, we did interviews with all the prospective champions. One of our questions was, you know, do, do, are you are you interested? Like, you know, do you see this as an issue? Do you want to be part of this? And so the only people that started were, the, I guess, the ones that, um, you know, were, were open to it from that sense. Um, but, you know, at the same time, uh, and I saw a question in the Q&A on this earlier with regard to the youth, um, I would say in round one, we we probably did tend to have more um, middle aged and older people among the champions. Uh, and but when we came to round two in the two communities where we did our second round and the existing champions um, were very much part of that process of just nominating the next ones to be trained, there was a very strong message in both countries. Um, that they wanted to have lots of younger people and they were, you know, really working very hard to identify those younger people that they saw as respective future leaders uh, within the community um, as that. So, you know, we've, we've ended up with a really good mix um, across all ages on that front. Thanks, Chris. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm looking for other questions. I know we've had lots of questions coming in, but they've all got a bit jumbled up in the... Um um in the in the in the in the masses of hellos from all of the interesting and, and really really widely dispersed people around the world who have been taking part in our webinar um now let me see now yes here's a very good question from from uh let me see now could you talk please about the process of how local champions are selected I think you've already said a little bit about that, but have you experienced challenges here such as consolidating the power of already locally powerful and influential people? And this is all about power relations within the society, within each community, um, and, and how you deal with that, because clearly it's a, a potentially um, difficult issue to, to, to overcome. Um, yeah, maybe I can just jump in uh, something about that. What I didn't make clear um, earlier, actually, was that uh, we specifically didn't include champions um, who were um, actual local government officials. Um, so we had champions who were um, on, you know, positions of local leadership, but not who were actually government officials. And uh, then in our um, step four of our training in all the countries, we then brought the uh, local government officials in together um, so that they could, uh, champions would have a chance to share some of what they learned. They actually um, performed some of their role plays for the local government officials to make them really aware of the issues that were coming up. Um, and then the, the champions and the government side were kind of having the opportunity to, to look at how they could collaborate together um, to strengthen and protect their community land rights. So, um, so that was one of our criteria. Um, we did have, you know, we had a few other criteria. I'm very happy to pick up on that after the webinar with, um, you know, with anyone who'd like to know in more detail about that actual process, but it, it took quite a long time. It was quite comprehensive. We've got lots of spreadsheets and lots of interview notes and all sorts of other scribbles from, uh, from that process. Thanks. Yes, I know there's a, a mass of information out there and I would suggest that to everyone that you go onto the Macora website and, and click on the, the link to the Waltz project, you'll find a, a, a whole host of material there um, to, 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 to give you much more detail about what we've been talking about today. Um, we have a question here from Stephanie Lanka. Thank you very much for sharing your insights on this project. Can you share what were some of the main challenges during the course of the five years? And this is directed at Liz. Um, I feel like I'm answering too many questions here, but that's okay. Um, did I mention COVID and the pandemic? Uh, that was a pretty big one. Um, we obviously, you know, that and that, but as I said before, actually that ended up being an opportunity to see how the communities, you know, would, uh, would respond to that and um, we had a lot of support from the communities who understood um, you know the difficulties when we were not able to come when we planned and we had to um, adapt the way we were doing the training um, we some of you will have seen on 
the website, photos of champions with face masks on and all sorts of things like that. Um, uh, we also, um, we had a specific issue actually um, last year we had planned in our fifth community, I mentioned we had a, a fifth community that uh, joined in 2017 and we had wanted to actually go back and develop the model a little bit um, to see how we could uh, embed um, the local government leaders, uh, the local government officials more with working alongside the champions from earlier on. So that was part of the project and part of the methodology that we wanted to test out. And uh, just due to the location and the COVID restrictions, we had to pull back completely on that. So that's something we're still you know, would like to explore more in the future. Um, but yeah, there's always challenges um, over a long period of time. Um, I don't know if Nara or Joyce want to jump in and mention anything specific on that, um, Nara. Yeah, thank you, please. <clears throat> Just want to add that, that uh, uh, the challenge, I would say, you know, like a snowstorm with dust, wind, and uh, all sorts of things were really challenging sometimes, especially during the springtime, but we obviously avoid to, uh, from this kind of natural disasters. And we, we actually planned the, uh, the training schedule with, together with the communities so that they tell us when they are uh, available and when they can attend, when they come from the mountain or from the step to the swim center to, to, have, to have our training. And other than that, I would say, you know, like uh, we give usually the, tra uh, the, the champions uh, give some time after one training, some, some time to digest, to, to dig down what they've learned. And also sometimes we give them chance, quite a bit of time to experience and to try out uh, what they learned in the training in their real life with their communities. So that was really good. And, uh, because some of them even called uh, us, you know, like they say, when are you coming? When is the next uh, uh, training? You know, like it's uh, it's very, you know, sometimes the, uh, a lot of people, it, we, we don't experience it that much, you know, like PCC, we do a lot of training, but these champions, they always ask us, chasing us after, you know, after us uh, and was really great actually working with them. Thank you. Thanks, Nara. Joyce, um, I mean, again, to answer the same question, thinking back over your five years of experience in Tanzania, I mean, could you maybe say something about those challenges in terms of, you know, there must have been some very difficult moments along the way. Could you maybe identify a couple of things? Yeah, I have a few examples to share in this one. Uh, yeah, we have heard a lot of stories of the success on this project, but always there are challenges. One of the challenges is, as actually Nara has shared about the distances in Tanzania, uh, people to bring, to bring them together uh, from their very, very remote areas was actually a challenge because it's very far and on the way, some of them may actually encounter uh, dangerous animals. So that's uh, one of the challenges faced us during the implementation of uh, this project. But another one uh, is actually, uh, if you can remember, I talked about a woman being considered a property. So that's even another challenge, changing the minds of the people from telling other people uh, like a property. Yeah, you know, it takes time to and that this is not a property. And remember, these people have been respecting and living bonded with their norms and customs that a woman is actually a property owned by a man. So telling them that it's not a property, but a person who also deserves even to own the properties, then it really took time. But slowly but sure, these people then start to realize and start to give the support. But another one, actually, as usual, there are stubborn people in the community. It was not every champion. Actually, not even a champion, let alone another community member who was ready to support uh, our project. I remember one example from one of the project communities. One day we were just doing a training and a leader from above, a uh, government leader came in. And as part of protocol, we have to give this leader a chance to actually greet people and say something. And after he's done actually to say some few words, he asked me the champions, how do you feel about their training? To me, it, it looks very well, but one person raised the hand. This is a pastor known as Paulo Sendela. He said, oh, 
I, we don't even understand these people. They have been preaching about women's land rights. They have been preaching about involving women in decision making. They do not know what they are talking about. So we are here to wait to know what they are telling us. We didn't really argue on that. Instead, the, the other champions helped us to intervene and say to the leader from the government, no, ignore this person. We know him. He is, that's how he is. So yeah, those are the few examples from Tanzania. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Joyce. I think that's a really, really good story and just underlines the importance of selecting the right people to be to be champions, both amongst the men and the women in, in, in your communities. Um, we have a question here for Joyce again. Joyce, get ready for this one. Uh, um, okay. From Stefan, the print, uh, Global Land Alliance Frindex Coordinator. Um, does the development of the recently developed LIS tool, the LIS tool in Tanzania, significant? Significantly improve women and community land rights, and maybe and at least look at this in terms of transparency, perhaps. Come again, Chris. Would you, would you like me to repeat the question? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, does the development of the recently developed LIS tool in Tanzania significantly improve women and community land rights in terms of transparency? Sorry, not clear. If you're not able to... Um, because it's cutting, it's, it's on and off, Chris. It's, it's cutting on and off, is it? Okay. Um, maybe I can move on to a, a more general question, just meanwhile, perhaps we could ask Stefan to maybe expand a bit on her question so we put it back to you, if that's okay, okay. if she wouldn't mind. Um, and I'll ask Casey to be on the lookout for that. Um, there's a question here from one of my colleagues at Macoro from Ray Purcell. Um, could I check with Joyce whether the Volts approach has been picked up by governmental or other institutions outside Haki Medini? Chris? Did you not get that as well? Is it a bad line? It's, it's on and off. It's cutting a little bit. Can you... Please uh, ask it. Okay, I'm going to say it very slowly. <laughs> okay, could I check with Joyce, is the question, whether the Volts approach <laughs> has been picked up by governmental or other institutions outside Hakim Medini? <laughs> Thank you very much for the good question, Chris. Uh, as we talk today, uh, not the higher government actually had taken the approach but the local government, I mean, the village leaders who have been receiving some insights, like some information from the trained champions have been using the very same approach uh, uh, by involving everybody in decision-making because, because even before that, even the village leaders were also and I say like ignorant when it comes to involving everybody in the community. So after creating this awareness among the community champions, the village leaders have started to like questioning why women are not here in this meeting. So it's to us, that's a success that the village uh, leaders uh, where actually the problems exist have actually taken up this approach and they are applying in their daily uh, meetings or discussions. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I've got a question here from Louisa Jansen at FAO. Um, your project lasted for five years. Um, this is a, a, a kind of question you'd probably expect from a, a major organization that's involved in this kind of work and particularly concerned about funding and, and um, very practical issues of that nature. The question is, with the lessons learned, would it be possible to achieve the same results in other countries in a shorter time frame? Uh, and the second part of the question is, do you intend to share lessons learned between countries? Um, shall I Liz, answer? Perhaps you might like to answer that one. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, thanks, Louisa, for the question. Um, so uh, we are, uh, I mentioned earlier, we're still continuing um, with our learnings and we're hoping to develop those over the next year or so. Um, one of the things that we are very keen to look at is actually bringing together in some kind of um, online forum, a bit like this, but uh, with our champions from both communities to share some of those learnings directly. Um, the first part of the question, sorry, I just missed that. Chris, could you, would you mind just to repeat the first part? I didn't write it down. Uh, effectively, it is, it's kind of, with the lessons learned, 
does it possibly achieve, achieve the same results in other countries in a shorter time frame? Oh, yeah, so okay. No, so implications so for funding and for resources and, mm -hmm. and, and, and impacts in, in the context of other things happening as well. Yeah, so um, so that was actually one of the frustrations um, when the pandemic kicked in last year, um, because uh, one of the goals of our round two, as well as um, as well as testing out how it worked in communities where we continued and communities where we uh, where we kind of pulled back and 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 left the champions to you know see how they would continue by themselves. Um, what we had actually decided to do or, or hope to do in our round two was to roll out the training much faster. Um, and also uh, by building in this mentoring process, we were trying to work out sort of something that would potentially be quite sustainable. I hesitate to call it a training of trainers, but that sort of idea, you know, that you, you branch out, you have your first cohort and then you have your next ones and then you expand out into surrounding areas. So um, we were really keen to try and um, see how that would work. You know, um, over the first round of training, we had bigger gaps uh, between the different sessions. Now, partly that was because instead of creating the whole curriculum at the start um, and just, you know, coming in and, and following like, well, you know, this is what we're doing, um, we did it step by step and we got feedback from the champions every step of the way. So we would design the first part of the training. We would do that. We would test for the feedback and then we would go away and, we would like develop what we were going to do next. So the whole process initially took quite a long time and we did want to test doing it faster. So again, that's something that, you know, we would hope that we might be able to do in the future. Um, but, you know, just life happens and a lot of things um, within the project had to change last year because of the pandemic. Um, so, yeah, you know, we've, we're very conscious of all these sustainability issues. And um, I think maybe I can just highlight as well, and, and perhaps Nara would say something about it as well, the, the collaboration that we embarked on um, in Mongolia with the National Land Agency there. Um, so we took the principles and the approach that we've been using in one of our communities, and then we worked hand in hand to develop these guidelines that um, Nara just uh held up in the book that's been published. So, you know, that's the kind of, those are kind of showing the opportunities for a more sustainable and much um, wider scale approach. Um, you know, the guidelines in that book are not exactly the same as the training approach that we followed, but it draws on the same principles. And it's that kind of thing that I think, um, you know, makes bigger impact. So I don't know, Nora, if you, do you want to just say a little bit more about, um, about how we went about that and how our champions were actually involved in, working with the local government um, in developing those guidelines. Do you want to say anything a bit more? Sure, thank you, Liz. <clears throat> yes, we, uh, we uh, as I said, we uh, really uh, closely work, collaborated with local, uh, with the national government and local government and with the champions. We, we very much involved with our champions and also other community members. And uh, one of our, our uh, um, the managing director of PCC, Tama, uh, made a big role in this, and she actually herself went out to the countryside and meeting with the people, and uh, including the, the governors, uh, local people, and they made, made a lots of uh, Fox Group discussions, and uh, she herself uh, actually uh, developed the, the guideline uh, together with the, with, with the local people and local government, and then uh, we uh, and also there was a um, uh, the the land officer from the uh, national land uh, agency also in land officers and management uh, the, the the sectoral directors also involved in it and it was it is actually a whole uh, the the whole process was was very holistic in in terms of including everyone uh, in, in it and then that's why. That's, that's why it, it is actually taken by the government to include in their guideline. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I would un underline that um, a lot of the world's program has been about developing the methodology and the tools. So in that context, uh, I think using this further in other places would uh, obviously take, a, if you like, could be done in a short time frame to, to respond also to, to Louise's point. Um, we have a, a really interesting question here about young and single women, which I think is really important. And, and I think it may, in fact, have to be our last question, unfortunately, as we are being limited by time. 
But this is a particularly important question, I feel, so I'm going to put this one to you all, but perhaps Liz might respond firstly. Uh, in relation to challenges, were you able to have young and single women with children or widows or other marginalized groups participate in your trainings or being champions? Often they are not able to take part in meetings due to their various difficult circumstances. Liz, would you perhaps like to kick off a response to that? And then I'm going to have to, I think, maybe close the session for the Q&A session at least. Um, yeah, sure. I mean, it's a good question for sure. And it's an issue that comes up in um, all research um, that's is certainly that I've been involved in is, you know, how do you ensure the participation when people have domestic responsibilities, um, among other things. And, you know, we had some, uh, I can think of one example, um, one of the times that I was with Nara in Mongolia when there was a big snowstorm um, and we had some young girls who were in the training and the fathers didn't want them to have to travel to the uh, place where we were doing training just because of the risk of travel in the snowstorm. Um, well, you know, of course, our champions, uh, those who had uh, young children and babies, they brought them with them to the training. Um, uh, one of our team members, um, you know, also had a young child for part of the training. And, and you know, so we, we really like, I think, um, just the way I would answer that is to say that we tried to live by example. So as a team, we tried to make sure that we were, um, you know, uh, respecting all of those constraints and considerations. And in, in encouraging um, the champions to do the same. So I hope that we managed to, you know, um, to overcome that as much as we could, but I, I do appreciate that it is um, still an ongoing problem, um, where, you know, when you're doing this kind of work. Thank you. Indeed, thank, thank you, Liz. Um, look, we've had some really excellent questions already and, and thank you so much for, for placing those questions to us. Um, I'm sure there are, there are dozens of other questions that need to be answered, but we simply haven't got time. Um, as I said earlier on, uh, we, the team will make a, a strong effort to, to answer all the questions if possible, uh, either in other contacts through emails or through, through the write-up and, and, and other formats. Um, thank you, everyone, for placing those questions. And I am sorry that we couldn't get through more of them, but I'm sure you understand our, our limitations in terms of time, particularly with this, this online format. Um, so in that context, I'm going to ask Liz if she'd like to make a few brief final remarks just to close up the presentation from the side of the, 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 the Waltz team um, before I, I close the meeting. Okay, thank you, Liz. Oh, thanks very much, Chris. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion and good to see all the questions um, coming up. I think, um, I'm not sure if we said this earlier, but we'll be keeping a record of all of that. So anything we haven't answered um, we are more than happy to reach out with you personally and, um, and follow up some of those discussions. Um, so yeah, just to recap um, our key takeaways. So really the importance of involving both men and women um, and also of committing to uh, the long-term involvement at the community level. I think those are two key things. Um, what we found um, really importantly is that protecting women's rights um, and community rights by strengthening gender equity around local land governance. Um, this, this really happens when the community leads the changes and chooses their own champions to address their own local issues. So, you know, we've very much taken the facilitating role, the supportive role, um, and really tried to develop things organically there. Uh, so we do see real potential to replicate this. And, and as Mike said earlier as well, not it's not so much just replicating, it's like adapting some of the lessons that we've learned and adapting some of the processes and the approaches um, and, you know, trying to look at different contexts where some of the lessons that we've learned will come to bear. And, you know, um, the report we've published today, a lot of the lessons will be in there. We're still um, ongoing with our lesson learning process. So do look out for more of our blogs and, um, and different um, different pieces that we'll be bringing out over the next year or so. Um, I think it's important really to emphasize the uh, participatory nature of the groundwork, so building relations with the community, checking what we're learning, checking the research findings are correct, checking what the community would like us to do with that and how we can help facilitate that. And really, um, I should just give a big shout out to all the people in our communities. Uh, we've learned so much from all of them. And, you know, we think the, the project has shown there's so many great uh, leaders out there. And it's just about having that legal knowledge and really above all, having the confidence 
uh, to navigate the system to speak up and protect their rights to work as a team. Um, so thanks very much, Chris. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I would say we're getting a, a load of really positive comments coming through here on the, on the chat box. Um, lots of thanks from various people and thank you for the documents and everything else. And we will make a, a very strong attempt to respond to all of the comments and questions that come in and provide email contacts and other information. But it's now time to, unfortunately, to, to close the meeting. Um, we have a limited time available. May I say myself how much I've enjoyed chairing it? Um, it's refreshing to see the Waltz approach moving away from what I would see as a traditional narrow focus on formalizing, for example, the rights of individual women or women's groups focusing on land titles, for example, and using a, a whole society approach with a the focus on changing gender relations to secure the rights of all women. By changing norms within the society, you address the situation of all women in that society. Um, and, and not just involving those lucky enough, for example, to benefit from more conventional titling and, and targeted programs. As women gain new roles and confidence, then it's clear that Walt is helping whole communities as well to gain more secure tenure and to achieve a greater voice in terms of what happens when new investments are proposed and implemented. I think this, this changing the way that men and women interact and bringing men into this equation in the world's, in the world's project is fundamental, involving male champions and, and, and really addressing the, the, the cultural norms in the community. Clearly, we have to respect um, the cultures and, and, and the wide diversity of cultures is, is exemplified by the, the two cases we've heard about today, but cultures can change and norms can change. And um, as we know, in many traditional societies, men are the guardians of those norms and, and, and the way they're applied. So bringing men in as, as champions in this process, I think has been absolutely critical to, to achieve the kind of wider change that are involved. And I think the most important thing really is that these normative changes will project into the future. And this addresses the issue of sustainability as well. Um, as the young generation move forward with these new changes uh, in the bank, as it were, and they will continue to impact on, on women in a very positive way and become the way to do things in the future. Um, the real life stories that we've heard from Joyce and Nara, I think have been fascinating and really underline the, 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 the key impact of this project um, at a very personal level for communities. And even listening to, to Joyce and Nara themselves, it's quite clear um, that the passion and the, and the personal impact that this project has had upon them as well. I think, which is, which is really wonderful to hear. Um, I think personally, uh, this kind of approach, again, addressing the gender relations, bringing women squarely into the whole discussion, the development model, the decision-making process, et cetera, et cetera, is, is essential and can usher in a new equitable and sustainable development model for, for everyone, for all countries, everywhere. Um, entrenched patriarchal relations and male-dominated policy process are, are still an issue even in a country like Great, Great Britain, where apparently lots of progress has been made, but it's still there in terms of um, equality and discrimination issues. So I think the, 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 the lessons that we've learned today have been fundamentally important for, for everyone. Thank you at this point. I'm going to close now and say um, thank you very much for everything that you've done, Nara, Joyce, Liz, and the whole Waltz team. Thank you for the work you've put in and, and, the, and, the, and also the, the information that you've given us today, giving us your time and giving us all such a lot to, to take away and to think about. Um, a thank you too to Mike Taylor from ILC and to Neil Sorensen and the Land Portal team for organizing this web, web event, web, webinar event together with Macquarie. And finally, of course, thank you to everyone who's taken part. Thank you to all of you, the participants, to our audience who registered and have taken part in today's webinar on women and community land rights for investing in local champions. Without the, the huge registration, I think something over, over 600 people registered for this event. This is what it's about. It's, it's engaging with you and, and getting this information out into, into, the, into the public domain so that we can all work together to take this excellent methodology forwards. So thank you very much once again. Stay safe, everyone, in these times of COVID. Thank you very, very much indeed, and goodbye.